I'm Jenna Wolf. That is the Hall of Famer Chris Carter. This is Nick Wright. Good morning, everybody. You look good. Like good Jenna. I like that dress. Thank you. It is yeah, That's sweet. not what you were saying before the show, though. What spicy man. Well, I just was ah. curious if she knew she had her glasses on. That's all. Listen. Sometimes she forgets they're on, takes them off right beforehand. I'm trying to help her out. That would have been do. a disaster. That you almost threw coffee on me. We're to start on top show. of it Ooh. this morning. Man, I'm a little punchy. We, the, these West Coast NBA I know. playoff They're games, late. man. Late. Oh my goodness are gracious! Late, but a punchy Nick is better than no Nick. I there, guess. Thanks, Jenna. Hey, Tom Brady has a new Pro Bowl receiver to throw to. The Dallas Cowboys seem hesitant to when sign Dak to a big deal. But we, so we got to start with the NBA playoffs. The hottest backcourt in the league last night belonged to the Portland Trailblazers. C.J. McCollum, Damian Lillard combined for 62 points as Portland beat OKC 114-94. They now take a 2-0 series lead. On the other side, Russell Westbrook, tough night, 14 points on 20 shots. Paul George got 27 in the loss. This series now shifts back to Oklahoma City Friday for Game 3. Here's Damian Lillard on Portland going up 2-0. I'm happy about it, but I really don't care. You know, I know how, how, how quickly things can change. I know that a series doesn't start until you win a game on the road. Um, and I also know how capable their team is. So we just got to keep, we got to maintain our focus, um, stay sharp in the, the things that we've been sharp in and understand that, you know, how well we played in the first game and the second game is not going to be good enough. Um, I got to play better. Um, and tonight, the loss, uh, I'm going to take full responsibility of uh, of tonight because um, uh, the way I played was uh, unacceptable and uh, I'm going to be better. So I'm not worried uh, one bit. Uh, my job is to make sure I continue to come out and, uh, you know, will and, and lead uh, our guys and uh, make sure we have a chance to win the game. All right, Nick, I'll start with you. How impressive were the Blazers last night? Blazers were great. Second half, spectacular, 60 to 40 after a tie game at halftime. They had a little surge at the end of the second quarter, tie the game at halftime, and then the game really changed, if not ended, in the final 90 seconds of the third quarter. This was a six-point game with less than a minute and a half left in the third, and the Blazers go on a 12-2 run, score 12 points in the last 81 seconds of the third quarter, and all of a sudden a six-point lead for them is a 16-point lead for them. And with the way the Thunder is shooting the ball, yeah. you're not going to be able to overcome that when you can't hit threes. Damian Lillard, see, is coming off what was maybe the low point of his professional career, not only them getting swept last season mm -hmm. by New Orleans without Boogie Cousins, but them getting swept in a series where C.J. was great, and he was really bad. This, that's not who he had been in his playoff career, but it's who he was last year. It made people question whether or not the Blazers should break up. C.J. and Dame, can you win with that undersized of a backcourt? And he has been spectacular in this series, and he and Russ don't seem to like each other. Russ had some spicy comments for him a couple months ago yes. about how he busts his A every single time they play. And since then, all Dame's done is go 31, 51, 30, and mm. 29 in the four games these two teams have played each other. D Dame has quite simply been the best player on the court through two games of this series and hasn't been close. And Dame, from a respect standpoint around the league, yep. he's always a guy just fighting for respect. When people talk about the top point guards in the NBA, his name is team, seems to be omitted from the list. Or at the end, you'd be like, oh, man, I forgot about Dame, Dame Lillard. Lillard. And I mean, he's got a sensational game. Um, you and I were talking this morning. I just like his overall demeanor because it's hard to match Russell's intensity. And you can match it without being as demonstrative as Russ is. And that's what he's, he's been. He's been very professional. He's taking it personal, but you can't see that. And his partner in CJ, man, it gives him that relief. Because let's not forget, them being up 2-0, they haven't had a bunch of playoff success, but we didn't expect them to win both of these games absent of their center. The right. horrific injury that they have late in the season, we didn't know how they would respond. The two games at home, after not having playoff success, man, th they have been led by their backcourt, especially Damian Lillard, who doesn't get the type of attention that he should around NBA circles. We got to talk about the Thunder. We talk so much about how Russell is the, the heartbeat of this team, and, and he has spent so many games where he's carried this team. He's coming off a 5-for-20 night. What do you make of that? He was, I mean, he owned it. I'll give him credit because he owned it. Yes. He was terrible. It was not just five for 20 from the field. It was six turnovers, five of which 
are the worst type of turnovers, live ball turnovers. Mm -hmm. So not a traveling violation, not an offensive foul, but where the other team gets the ball in live play, those, tur those turnovers almost always lead to easy buckets. And this is now a really critical moment, not only obviously in the Thunder season, but in Russell Westbrook's career. I mean, they since Kevin Durant left, first year he's gone, 47 wins. They lose in the first round in five games. Last year, 48 wins. They yep. lose in the first round in six games. This year, 49 wins. So essentially the same regular season team, the three years KD's been gone. But this year, they're the, they're the favorite. I know they're the sixth seed, so it looks odd. But because of the Nurkic injury, they were the Vegas favorite going into this series. They, it's not over because they haven't lost at home yet. But when you're hitting five or six three-pointers a game as a team, you're not mm -hmm. going to win playoff games. And when your two best players aren't playing well at all, Paul George was awful in game one. Russ was really, really bad last night. No matter how big of a Russell Westbrook fan you are, you can acknowledge that. They have to both be outstanding in game three to turn this into a series again. Yeah, when you think about these, these two guys when they partnered up in Paul George, Man, his first half of the regular season was outstanding. Came up with some shoulder problems the last third of the season, struggled down the end. But really, man, this story is about Russ. Because Paul George, he, he, he noticeably, he's been injured. And you would expect Russ, after game number one, to send a message in game number two. And he wasn't able to do that. And it's about the matchup that he has. He doesn't have a matchup that he can dominate, and that's given him problems. You could see last night that he started getting very, very frustrated. Man, this game number three uh, this weekend, it becomes one of the biggest games of his career. I think they play Sunday. Maybe I or? think game four would be Sunday. They play. I think they play Friday evening. Yeah, but that game being one of the biggest of Russ' career, a guy, a former MVP, you would think this early in the playoffs, yes, with the early exit last season, Man, you with can't Paul have George it. deciding that, yes, I am going to partner with Russ, he's got to be questioning that. Russ has got to be questioning that. And you could see it in the press conference after the game. And Paul George, by the way, to his credit, was good last night. Paul George did his job. What is... What is so odd for Russ, and I think one of the reasons he's frustrated is he is in the past, even if he can't always check Dame, he's been able to bully whichever of the guards is on him. Whether it's CJ or Dame, he can take him down on the block. He can take him off the dribble. Russ could do none of that. He couldn't get anything he wanted last night. Five of 20 is exactly as bad as it sounds, and it's actually a little worse than it sounds. Because he only got to the free throw line except uh, twice the entire game. So, mm -hmm. so Kevin Durant got killed justifiably yesterday for only taking eight shots. But he took a little bit more than that because he shot 12 free throws. When you look at the boxer, you're like, all right, so Russ was 5 of 20 with three free throw attempts? Right. That can't happen. That means he's not attacking. That means he's not getting to his spot. It means he's not getting to the rim. Unless he can turn his game around and we can see, you know, Paul George build off the 27 he had last night, is there any chance the Thunder can bounce back? get themselves back into this series? Uh, there, there is a chance. Uh, they talked about it. The series doesn't start until the home team loses a game or the visiting team wins on the road. So, yes, there is still hope. They have a great home court advantage, but the psyche of these two players becomes very, very important in game number three. How many early round failures can one of our best players in the NBA have? And Russ, you know, he has his detractors and everything. He has his people that constantly are after him because of his style and, and maybe some some of his demeanor, but this is unexcusable. If they lose in the first round to Portland, minus their center, man, it, 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 there's going to be a lot of questions as far as Russ going forward with Paul George there in a uh, OKC, Nick. And those, those questions were going to be the ones that I thought going into this series Portland was going to have to look at. Even though Dame had yes. been committed, I want to be here, I want to mm -hmm. stay with the Blazers, if once again you're one and done, if once again you have a glass ceiling in the playoffs, even if it's bad luck because of Nurkic, do you need to consider this offseason splitting those two up? OKC can't really split these guys up. Russ is never leaving. Paul George just signed an extension. And is this who they are? Now, how, how can they win game three? Yeah, Russ needs to play better. Paul George needs to play like he did in game two. But in this series, they are 10 of 61 from three. They are 5 of 28 and 5 of 33 mm -hmm. in those two games. You can't win NBA playoff games shooting 16% from three. So it's Russ has to play better and some shots got to fall for Oklahoma City. All right, game three between these two at OKC. It is Friday night. We'll talk more about this coming up. On the other side, though, can Demarius Thomas be an impactful weapon for Tom Brady? 
That's next on FS1. You can always check us out on the Fox Sports channel on Sirius XM. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We'll get to Tom Brady's newest weapon in just a second. But first, Raptors magic last night. Kawhi split in the D, delivers the one-handed slam. He was special last night, Nick. Man, he made so many difficult shots. That's the best offensively I've seen Kawhi in a playoff game. Oh, oh no doubt. No question about it. Must win game for the Raptors. He showed More up. from this one. Aaron Gordon hangs in the air through contact and finishes with a nice little layup. Good call there. Draws the body contact. Does an old finger roll there at the end. Very, very athletic. Orlando presents some problems for Toronto. Yeah, but th this one you could tell Toronto was the more urgent. They had the higher level of urgency. 16-2 to two to start that game. All right, Blazers and Thunder. C.J. McCollum crosses up Paul George and then finishes with the pretty floater. Hey, that top five ranked Thunder regular season defense, feel free to show up whenever you want. <laughs> Playoffs started a few days ago, fellas. I mean, just getting cooked. At the end of the third quarter, they let Seth Curry. Oh, and, but this is just old man. Oh, this... D. Lil has Raymond Felton stumbling all over the place before he hits that. Isn't it a special brand of crime, a special classification when you do it to a senior citizen? Oh. You can't have Dame doing this to Raymond oh. Felton in the quarter. I mean, look, he's pudgy, too. That ain't fair, man. Felton would take offense to that. Yeah, he's been fat since skinny. No, he knows. He knows. <laughs> he's, he knows he's a pudgy fella. Festively plump. Let's talk some football this morning. Patriots signed wide receiver Demarius Thomas to a one-year deal yesterday. He's exactly the kind of player Belichick feasts on, right? A 31-year-old veteran entering his 10th year and coming off both a down season in Texas. Oh, and a torn Achilles. Uh, but the Patriots have a very depleted receiving core, and the longtime Broncos receiver seemingly fits the bill. See, how much will signing Demarius Thomas help Tom Brady and the Patriots? Well, if they sign anyone with experience right now, it helps for the offseason because they don't have anyone on the roster. They don't have any competent tight ends that you would call a starter, and they don't have what I would call a number two wide receiver. So, Yes, yeah, signing them right in the offseason. They do this all, all the time. Last year, we went through, and I think we started after the draft. Right, Nick? Right. And they interviewed 40. It was 33. It was 33. They brought in over the from right after the draft until the playoffs. They had 33 different wide receivers come in the building and out the building. And this is what Belichick has seen. He doesn't believe in the draft as far as drafting wide receivers high. He believes in trying other guys out, especially veteran players. He likes them to be smart. He likes them to be versatile. Likes them to be able to do more than one thing, line up in more than one position. And if they can play special teams, he loves that because he likes to be able to manage his roster that way. Demarius Thomas, none of these things. He's not, <laughs> not consistent. I was wondering when you said that. I was like, special teams? I, okay, none of these things. It's, it's part of how he manages yeah. the roster. When you have a wide receiver, at 31, he plays no special teams. He returns no kicks. So now what is he? Is he a, a one-down player on third down? Because I don't believe at this point, especially after a torn Achilles, like he's going to be ready to play 65 plays. I know he's got intel with Josh McDaniel from their years in, in Denver where he was drafted number one when Josh was there. But, man, this is about playmakers. This is about creating separation, giving the ball to guys, especially they can get yards after the catch, all these things don't fit his strong suit. Now, should he be playing in the league? Yes, but after a torn Achilles late in last season, I don't think that he's going to be on the roster at the beginning of the season, active and starting in game number one for New England. And this is one of the places where you can tell where the information came from on the contract. The agent is the source of this, I promise you, because you, everyone saw one year, six million bucks. You're like, well, six million. It's a lot of money for the Pats to give up for a guy coming off a torn Achilles. Yeah, how much are they paying Edelman? What? Edelman, they're paying Edelman right around that, right? Right under that. I, it was five and a half million for Julian Edelman. Like, so you see that, you're like, wow. They, I, the details haven't been released. I would wager any amount of money. This is a base salary of about two million bucks with active roster incentives worth about two million bucks and then statistical incentives worth about two million bucks that can get you to that six million dollars. I... I think that, I mean, I know he tore his ACL in week 15 or in the 15th game, week 16 He'll of last season. He'll be seven months removed from the injury yes. when that, the Patriots open training camp. Seven months. I also know that Tom Brady does not have a long history of guys not developing a rapport with him on the practice field and then 
all of a sudden, him throwing him a bunch of balls. What was the story with Josh Gordon? Took him a week of inact of being inactive, and then another week before he really was featured in the offense in any way, and then another week before it's like, oh, this is what you can get from Josh Gordon. I, I understand why the Pats would do this, because right now, after Julian Edelman, who are their pass catchers? Forget wide receivers, pass catchers. Philip Dorsett, Austin Safarian Jenkins, they, they, these are the yes. names we're talking about. The kid from the University of Miami, Braxton Berrios, they drafted in the sixth round. Like, who are, who is going to catch passes from Tom Brady? You said they don't love drafting receivers early. Man, they might not have a choice this year. No. With, with, with given their drastic need on the roster, they might have to. So I, I root for Demaris because it's when I mean, you're in a contract year and at the very end you pop an Achilles. That's brutal. But I don't think this is an impact move for the New England Patriots. If there's a way he can get himself healthy by the time the season starts, do you look at something like, well, he played with Peyton Manning. Mm -hmm. Brady loves smart receivers, love guys who are mm -hmm. going to get the offense right away. Do you see maybe that helping him factor, that being one of the factors in bringing him into New England? The, the problem is since Peyton Manning. That, when Peyton Manning retired, all his stats retired. So guys are like, are, are you a product of a system or are you a product of a great quarterback? And most of the times, what they're going to do is say that you're a product of that quarterback. Last year, when he went to Houston, yeah, they were excited to get him, but the only reason why they signed him because they had a bunch of injuries. Yep. At this point in his career, he has never been a big separation guy. So at the top of the route, he doesn't create a lot of separation. He is not a great hands catcher. So, yes, he did have success with Peyton Manning. He was a phenomenal athlete, but at this point in his career, what is he? I believe he's one-dimensional, and when you don't play special teams, you don't do a lot of other things, it's the same thing they got into last offseason. Didn't they sign Michael Floyd? They do this all the time with veteran players who've had some success. They bring them in, kick the tires with them. As Nick said, they don't invest a bunch of money in them, so the contract – leads in New England's favor that they would be released because they just don't make mistakes. The, 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 our problem right now with New England, because they have Tom Brady, we think that there's something else. New England is a running football team, and they showed you that with the Chargers. They showed you that in all the other, the Kansas City game and in the Super Bowl. They ran the ball 47% of the time in the playoffs, the most in the postseason. So they are a running football team, regardless of what the rest of the league is doing. They are leaning on Dante Scarnecchia, the, the offensive line coach, that he might be able to create some type of advantage, and that there's only a few teams that have linebackers that are over, over 230 pounds. So Belichick is taking advantage of what teams are trying to do right now. So we'll see how they develop into this season. But right now, if they were to play a football game and they had 65 plays, they'd be running the ball 40 times. You mentioned they brought in Michael Floyd. How, remember Reggie Wayne? That was a story because Reggie Wayne's probably going to be in the Hall of Fame, and we know, or at least was an all-pro receiver for a long time. Reggie Wayne never did anything for them. Eric Decker, they brought him in. He, the, Demarius Thomas was extraordinary from 2012 to 2014. Averaged 1,500 yards Average 12 touchdowns when he was at his athletic peak and when Peyton was still Peyton. In 2015, he was pretty good. And then since then, 2016, he had 1,000 yards. 2017, he had 900 yards. 2018, he had 650 yards for two teams and popped his Achilles. The odds are that this is something of a redshirt year in one form or another for Demarius Thomas, if not the end of the run for him. I get why he would sign up with New England. If I can get healthy, if I can be okay by midseason, if I can make the roster, get that playoff check, show, you know what I mean, show people what he can do with a winning team. But this is this is a name we know more than it is a player that you should expect to make a major impact. I, I would expect for him to go through all the rehab this offseason, not get a lot of intel. I expect him probably start the season on the pup. And what they'll look at is when they can activate him, he would be that type of player that at midseason, if we could bring him off the pup and he could give us some type of boost. But September, October, I don't look for him to be a huge part of New England and what they're doing offensively. All right, let's take a break there. Back to basketball on the other side. Are the Lakers worried that LeBron James is gaining too much power? We'll tell you why we're asking next on First Things First. Check out Premier Boxing Champions Saturday, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on Fox and the Fox Sports app. Welcome back to the show. Time for us to go viral. Ryan Fitzpatrick is in line to be the Dolphins' starting quarterback this season. Oof. 
And the 36-year-old veteran has a very unique reason why he isn't exactly in mid-season form. About your way, how do you feel right now on the field? I would say I'm in I'm in peak off season form. Uh, I think two <laughs> weeks ago I was in peak off season form. You know, I, the thing the thing with me is, uh, you know, I, I have seven kids. Uh, so in January we have three birthdays. So we've got you know a family birthday party which includes cake, and then we've got a uh, friend's birthday party which includes cake. So that's six times in January. Birthdays in March, March 1st, March 6th, and March 11th. Which again, that's a tough stretch. That's cake uh, six out of what is that, 10 or 11 days. And so, uh, then we've got an April birthday, so it doesn't slow down. But now that the birthdays are behind me, and I think I'm going to try to go from peak off-season form, uh, maybe down to peak in-season form, I'll be okay. Should be a cakewalk. Wow, nice, wow. nice. Wow. Wow. Rookie coming through. <laughs> so. So his his argument is much like Anthony Davis. I don't pick my clothes. They I, I have no choice in the matter. I sit there I with my mouth to agape. Eat the cake. Here comes the game. I just it's just it's birthday cake's there. I gotta eat it. Doesn't matter. We got football season coming up. A Come couple on. years ago, Ryan Fitzpatrick and I we walked Augusta National together. Oh. Watched the Masters and everything. He was in off season form there too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. And when when, when you don't play football that well, and they and you start doing interviews, it's better to talk about your kids and cake. <laughs> That's a good point. It's a good point. Hey, you look, he got on the show. He Absolutely. got on the show. It's good Seven stuff. kids though, man. No uh, <laughs> that's, that's a lot of kids. Time for stories to start your morning brought to you by the unexpected energy of Exxon Mobil. The Patriots signed wide receiver Demarius Thomas to a one year deal yesterday. The 31 year old veteran entering his 10th year will have a chance to make up to six million dollars next season in incentives. See how much will signing Demarius Thomas help Tom Brady and the Patriots. Well anyone with a pulse right now would help from a tight end standpoint from a wide receiver standpoint. This is probably the worst group of wide receivers since Tom Brady's been there that they've had on the roster. Now, it's the offseason. And last year, Nick, they churned through the NFL looking for. You talked about over 30 guys came into their facility for they, that, that they position. tried out and everything. So they're trying that again. I would be shocked if he's on the opening day roster. I would look for him to be a pup. Um, where he physically able to perform and then potentially get activated. But he's not the type of receiver because he doesn't play special teams. He can only play the X receiver, can't play the slot, can't play the Z. So I don't I don't look at this as a big signing. Yeah, I, it, I think it would be fair to say you set the over under on catches passes. He will catch from Tom Brady at point five and it's a, in the whole in his career with the Patriots and it's a coin flip whether it's the over or the under. He is no guarantee to make the roster. I think he is a guarantee to not be on the week one roster just because you pop your Achilles in late December. Yes, it is very difficult to be ready by early September, but they, they got to find people because they got Edelman and Safarian Jenkins as pass catchers right now. All right to the NBA. Oh, the boy. Nuggets rallied from 19 down to beat the Spurs 114 105 series now tied at a game apiece. Nick, did Denver save their season last night? Well, they would. Their season would have been over with a loss. So yes, it is at least temporarily saved. And credit to them for making me look like a big old doofus. They're down 19 midway through the third quarter, and I announced their season dead. I announced that they were total frauds as contenders. I stand by that second point, by the way. And then they went on a massive comeback. Great fourth quarter comeback for them, where they went one. And by the way, shout out to Jamal Murray. For the first seven quarters of this series, see, he did nothing. He had 21 in the fourth last night. Huge win for Denver. He actually became that player that you've talked about. With all these young group of guys, they don't have a bunch of experience. Which one of these guys would step out, step up and be an elite scorer? Yep. Be that guy that you have to take away. And Jamal Murray, late in the game, man, he was special. Coach Calipari told me at Kentucky he thought one day Jamal could be a top five scorer in the NBA. Wow. Last night in the NBA, you could see his shot making like we hadn't seen before. All right, to the Raptors now. They even their series up with the Orlando Magic, beating them 111-82. Kawhi Leonard led the way with 37 points. See, what impressed you the most about Toronto last night? Man, how aggressive Kawhi was on the offensive end. Now, you know he's one of the best two-way players, if not the best that we have. But, man, he was on the attack mode from the beginning. He, he, he knew what, the, what was at stake. 
and he was very, very aggressive. Now, this was a must win for Toronto going against a team that they should be over. Oh, they yeah. should be super over. They should overmatch them as far as mm -hmm. athleticism. Um, the, the size that the guards of Orlando do give Toronto some problems, but Kawhi was special, and Kyle Lowry did show back up. Yeah, hey, I, I was glad. Listen, Kyle Lowry, game ones of the playoffs, not so great. Game two of the playoffs, though, Typically pretty good. He was very good last night, but the story was Kawhi Leonard. The Raptors had a sense of urgency. It was 16-2 to before a lot of people got this game turned on, and then Kawhi in the third quarter. After 17 in the first half, yes. 17 in the decisive third quarter that made the fourth quarter unimportant. Great win, important win for Toronto, and I don't know if the Magic get another win in this series. All right, finally, the bad news for the Warriors was confirmed yesterday. Boogie Cousins is out indefinitely with a torn left quad. Took place in the Game 2 loss to the Clippers. See, how vulnerable now are the Warriors without Boogie? Oh, I think they are vulnerable, and, and the people that, that, that think that Oh, man, everything is still the same. No, absolutely not. If they lose any of their top six players, and I would throw um, Andre Iguodala in there, man, they're, they're going to suffer. And the reason why is because Sean Livingston, as a bench player, is not as good as he was before. Nope. Now, we knew that when they added the rant, they were going to lose some of that bench. But veteran players coming off the bench will to give them a lift. Iggy is not the same player offensively that he was before. So now, if you lose, lose a starter, man, my bench, I already I don't have any type of depth. I'm worried about my big men. Can they score on a regular basis? And don't have a big man that can stretch the defense. So there's certain things that Big Boogie Cousins was special at. There's a reason why he was an all-star. There was a reason why people were upset, terrified when he joined the Warriors, his chess move. Mm -hmm. So, man, we have to acknowledge what kind of player Boogie is. Any, let's look at any NBA team. They lose their starting center. What team will we be like, oh, they're okay? And the Warriors are in that group. There is no team that can suffer a starter losing, and that including Golden State, the rest of the pack. It was like Augusta. When uh, Molinari was going down the middle, down the middle, down the middle, and then he hit the ball in the water at 12, everyone came back into the tournament. When he went down, NBA, everyone came back to, um, to Golden State being a champion and trying to get that, that, get that elusive three-peat. But much like Molinari, it'll probably take them hitting another one in the water for them to be out of it. Like, it, it, with, it, Molinari was, he hit the one in the water, but then on 15 when he hit the other, yeah, one, the other one, that's when all of a sudden he wasn't in the lead anymore. They, they're still the favorites, but they are not the drastic, overwhelming, minus 300 in Vegas favorites anymore. You said before the show, a guy they might wish they had this year is a guy that sat right here earlier in the season, David West, another veteran oh. big man that they could trust to give minutes to. Because yes. when you're talking about the lack of depth, Steph, Katie, Clay, Draymond, Iggy. There's your Hamptons five, right? Then who else do we trust? Sean Livingston, he's going to hit that herky-jerky 12-footer that looks yes. like a terrible shot, but he always makes it. Andrew Bogut, they trust. He was in Australia six weeks ago, right? Oh, Kayvon Looney, they're going to have to trust him because he's going to be a starter. And then after that, you're to the Alfonso McKinney, Jordan Bells of the world, Quinn Cook, guys you don't want to see getting big-time playoff minutes. What I think is critical for the Warriors now, absolutely beyond reproach critical, is that they do not lose another game to the Clippers. That they make every, they they settle themselves and they remind the rest of the league we didn't really need Boogie. Because I think the Rockets are going to make short work of the Jazz. And I think the way the bracket falls funny, Getting the Warriors in round two instead of round three for the Rockets could be beneficial as far as James Harden's fatigue and Chris Paul's health. And so if the Warriors are still figuring out what they're doing at the center position and they drop another game to the Clippers where that Staples crowd's going to be wild, even though usually L.A. crowds aren't that great, then all of a sudden their, their task in round two, which is when the playoffs really begin for them, becomes that much greater. Just quickly before we move on, hasn't the narrative around Boogie Cousins changed a lot? Because when it was first announced, it was, well, this is just an insurance policy. This team is so jacked and stacked. Now you're adding one more player. Let's see if this even you need a player. Mm -hmm. He might not even seen playing time in the, in, in the playoffs. They have their, their, their goal set, their team set. So how much are they really losing by not having Boogie there? Now they're the, the very dominant team. That's you know right, the very dominant team that was down 3-2 to the Rockets last year. 
the very dominant team that did go seven against the team they're going to have to play in the next round. That's the and a very dominant team that was not facing potentially a team half as good as Milwaukee in the NBA Finals. They're still the favorites. But if, if I'm right that this Rockets team is better than they were last year, then even without home court, if they play the same Warriors team, it should be closer. You mentioned any team lose a starter. Speaking of the Rockets, they lost Maba Mute essentially for the playoffs last year with that shoulder injury. They still tried to play him, then they couldn't. That hurt them. If you lose a rotation player, much less an all-star, you're going to be weakened no matter how talented to, you to are. To your point, Jenna, at the beginning, yeah, they were jacked and stacked, as you said. They were probably the most talented team in NBA history. So that's why people were, man, my goodness, they were already talented, and now they added an all-star center. The only thing we didn't know about Boogie was when he came back, would he be healthy, and when would he come back? And then maybe a little conflict as far as the locker room, but, man, th that, that locker room thing is totally blown out of proportion. He's done well there, but they were the most talented team that I had seen in the last 20 years. So when you lose a Boogie Cousins, yeah. yes, you still might be the favorite, but they're not as talented, and their turnovers and their lack of defense now becomes very, very important. All right, let's move on to the Lakers. They're still looking for a head coach. Job requirements for that position are simple. Must get along with LeBron, must know basketball. And, oh, did I mention the part about LeBron? Former Cavs coach Ty Lue is the current front runner, but according to reports, some in the Lakers front office are concerned with the optics of that potential hire, saying that would be, quote, giving LeBron too much control. Cece, what would you make of that? What was your reaction when you read that? Let me tell you something, Lakers. I know you guys are one of the most historic franchises of all time. But right now, if I'm in the building, who do I want to talk to about basketball? Magic Johnson just left. And like the rumors said, Magic Johnson was getting ready to fire Rob Palenka and getting ready to fire Luke Walton. So that was his opinion on the basketball. He gave that opinion to Jenny Buss. She didn't agree with him. So Magic went to Stephen. I'm getting ready to have a press conference. Not even going to call her. Now, Rob Palenka, it seems like he's gained more power yeah. in this whole thing. So how did Palenka get in control? Well, it goes back to the Kobe Bryant days. Why did they sign Kobe to that bad contract? Rob Palenka did negotiate that contract, right? Jenny Buss was a part of that, right? right? So now she's talking to Kobe. So Kobe has an influence on the organization. Rob Palenka's there. Now as Rob Palenka's getting more power, who is she talking to? Like, who are her basketball friends? Because when I get into a crisis as far as football or basketball, man, I go through my phone, go through my Rolodex, and look at who can I call to be able to talk out this situation, someone who can enlighten me. And after we're done talking, you call someone else. Absolutely. Yeah. Call your wife, Steph. Right. <laughs> She's way more informed. Okay. But, no. The, the, <laughs> What's that? That's what you no, get. But, but the truth of the matter is I'm concerned who Jenny Buss is talking to. Because mm -hmm. LeBron having too much control right now. That I don't even think that exists because there's no one in that organization that I would rather talk basketball, make basketball decisions than LeBron. Now, I know the optics. Oh, one guy can't control the team. And LeBron, he this is not his desire. David Griffin talked about all the misconceptions about LeBron in Cleveland. Oh, he's picking players. And he was like, it's totally different than that. LeBron wants someone to be able to do that, and then I would bounce things off of him, but he wouldn't be coming to me suggesting, oh, go out and get these type of players. It's something that we conjure up and that we think. LeBron should be a part. If one of the greatest basketball players ever, when I decide to come to Los Angeles, that's part of the deal. It's always been a part of the NBA. We act like the star player don't have power. You went back to one of the great stories in Magic Johnson. I got a problem with the coach. Okay, that ain't no problem. We just get rid of the coach. And here is a trademark of bad businesses, organizations, sports franchises, concerned about optics instead of results. Miss me with its bad optics. Is it the right decision? Will it help you it, win? Will it help you achieve your goal? You can get through bad headlines. I, the, the college basketball team in the Lakers' backyard, UCLA, was going through a coaching search. They never once seemed to consider Rick Pitino. He might be the best college basketball coach alive, but it would have been awful headlines, awful optics, so instead they settle. 
things go with Mick Cronin because you know what? The, the, the newspaper's going to have a good write-up about that. Okay, what's the newspaper going to write up about that when you get bounced in the second round of the NCAA tournament? When you're happy to make the NCAA tournament? What, what is this narrative? Do you care about the narrative of the next month or the narrative of the next three years? Do you care about, are we, is every decision we make putting us in the best position to maximize LeBron James's dwindling prime, or are we worried about what Kobe's whispering in Palinka's ear, who's then conducting these interviews? Forget the Mark Stein report in the New York Times yesterday, the day before, saying league executives are ecstatic and shocked that the Lakers aren't doing a team president search. There's like, hey, Rob Palinka's here, and Kurt Rambis, his wife already works with the team, might bring her... It, it makes no sense. And so I, if someone will present to me an option that is clearly better than Ty Lu, I'm all for it. But Ty Lu, the, the idea that, well, how good of a coach is, do we know if Ty Lu is really when he's only coached LeBron? Well, how good of a coach is Steve Kerr when he's only coached Steph and Clay and then KD? Like, yes, we, we've never seen Ty Lu outside of the Cavs with LeBron, but they achieved maximum potential every single year. Without the best roster. Of, is certainly the last and, year. And we saw them make adjustments. We saw them change their roster three times. So Ty Lu would be an improvement. But look at your recent history. Since Jenny Buss has taken over, forget what the optics are. Look at the optics that you created, Jenny Buss. Look at the decisions that you have made. Now, which is worse? The, the perception that LeBron might have something to do with this or us not being in the playoffs for how many straight seasons? Six straight years. And this is what I was alluding to yesterday when we talked about the coaching situation. I said the only reason Ty Lu would not – I, I like Monty Williams. But the only reason Monty Williams would be ahead of Ty Lu on the hierarchy of who you want to go higher is because you would feel like, okay, there won't be a bad headline. There won't be people saying the LeBron's UCLA in too much control. Example. I – it just makes no sense to me. The, if you can present to me information that there is a free agent you're going after that would be turned off by Ty Lue, then I'll listen to that. If there, if Kyrie Irving would say, no, nah, I'm not going to go there because I didn't like Ty then I'll listen to that. But otherwise, it make of, the reason Ty Lue's name has been associated with this job since Forbes Open is because it makes too much sense. Well, for me, I would like him to search for a president. And yeah. if the president wanted someone else and he wasn't Ty Lue, I'd be willing to listen to the president. But right now, if Rob Palenka and he's got one choice, they need to select Ty Lue. That's their best option. If they want to be able to get into the playoffs, that spot that the Clippers stole for them, that they could be playing the Warriors right now, Boogie Cousins being out, <laughs> they missed a hell of an opportunity this year. They need to be able to change their decision-making because what they've done the last five or six years is uh, those optics are awful. Ty Lue helped them win a title, got to the finals three times. You're telling mm -hmm. me that's worse than the optics? I don't know. Coming up, is Russell Westbrook to blame for the Thunder going down 0-2? That's ahead on First Things First. <laughs> FS1 is your destination for today's best sports shows. Tune in for the biggest personalities on the biggest stories. We get you started right here on First Things First. Catch it on Monday through Friday only on FS1. And this morning, we'd like to get you started with a very important birthday wish. I would like to wish Stephanie Gosk, my Stephanie Gosk, a very happy birthday. She's homesick today, so at least I know she's watching. Yeah, it might not be, no but she can check it out on DVR. Happy <laughs> birthday, Steph. What? <laughs> Nothing. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you. Brian Westbrook is with us on a very special day. Thanks right. for being with us. Thank you for having me. Uh, you want to talk some Steelers? Let's do it. Let's talk some Steelers then. They are attempting to move forward after losing Lev Bell and trading Antonio Brown. How do you do that? Well, you get everyone on that team to buy in. The Steelers kicked off their offseason workout program on Monday with a number of veterans on hand, prompting Ben Roethlisberger to say, we want to show we are here, dedicated to this team, dedicated to having a great season. We are all about each other. Brian, does this feel like a fresh start for Ben Roethlisberger and the Steelers? Well, I have to believe that he certainly feels that way. I think that uh, when you went through some of the things that they went through last season with Antonio Brown and, of course, Le'Veon Bell not being there, it, this has to feel like a, a fresh start. This is another opportunity for him. And, and I think this is why he was at phase one of the offseason program, another opportunity to show that he can be a leader. 
and he wants to lead this football team, you guys understand, you have to have buy-in from every single level. And now with Ben making these comments, these purposeful comments, be dedicated, we're all in this together, we're a team. Mm -hmm. He's talking to the media, but he's really talking to his teammates to make a, st a statement to say, mm -hmm. all those things that happened last year, they're not going to happen again this year, not on my watch. He wants to reestablish himself as a leader. I, I think it's a fresh start for Ben. I also think it's a fresh start for Mike Tomlin. And I believe that if, you're, if I'm Mike Tomlin, I'm having a conversation way before the first minicamp. I'm saying, listen, we have to reestablish ourselves, coach as well as a leader, as well as quarterback, as uh, for the leader of this football team. That's what started yesterday. But when it comes to Ben Roethlisberger, isn't this the kind of thing where you need to see it before you hear it? Well, Haven't we heard the words before? But this is seeing it. This is him being there on the very first showed day. Up. Yeah. Him in, and now. It should be noted that maybe just as a side story here, Ben is also hoping for and awaiting a new contract. And there's a couple ways to go about getting a new contract in the NFL. One is don't show up to anything, but quarterbacks never do that. Mm -hmm. The other is to show up to everything, <laughs> everything. and to be all in team guy. And so I'm sure that has something to do with it. But the other part that has to do with this is I've never doubted that Ben Roethlisberger wants to win that he wants the Steelers to be successful. Now, he might want it to happen on his own terms to a degree. He might want it to happen where he's allowed a level of dispensation other players aren't. But he now knows this team is Ben Roethlisberger and 52 kids, as Kevin Colbert said, even if they're not actually kids, that the if the Steelers are not successful this year, two people are going to get the blame. Ben and Tomlin. Yeah. That's it. And so they are going to have to, after a few years in my mind, see – of underachieving to their level of talent. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to overachieve given their level of talent mm -hmm. due to the connective tissue of the team, due to these comments actually being real, that it is one unit mo or a, a, a mass of people moving as one. And so this is the this is the start of what you're saying, talking about, seeing it, saying it, then seeing yeah. it, then doing it. Well, first things first. It, it, they are doing the right thing as far as how they're verbalizing everything. Because moving forward, they, they have to have one common theme with Mike Tomlin, with Roethlisberger, and the other leaders. The offensive line, who have you seen them sign to contract extension, they have said the right thing. But from my perspective, you don't get a fresh start in the NFL unless you change locations. All right? One of the reasons why I left Philadelphia, people might think it was for something else, but because Buddy Ryan, he was never going to trust me. Regardless of what I did, he was never going to trust me. And what I've seen in NFL locker rooms, we saw this last year with the Cleveland Browns and Josh Gordon. He came back. They said it was a fresh start. But they didn't forget because as soon as they started seeing some, some of the other stuff, they got rid of it. Right. So what happened to the fresh start? Right. Because a fresh start, man, it's like, hey, my first mistake is my first mistake. No. So Ben, he has the opportunity to be able to verbalize it. He is going to get a contract extension, but there is no fresh start. There are guys in that locker room sitting around saying, I know who he is, and we're going to see it. What week are we going to see it? When we get in a tough situation, when are we going to see it? When the coach sends in a play, when are we going to see it? So there are guys on that roster that he's going to have to prove to them because they have seen over and over again Ben Roethlisberger do some of the things that people let out into the public. And Ben and Tomlin, it's up to them to stay consistent on their messaging point. So, Ben Roethlisberger, there is no new start inside the same team that you're with. So, he's going to have to be awful consistent, and they're going to have to win an awful lot of games because that's what makes these things go away, Brian, when you win. One of the things that Antonio Brown said, it was Ben and then the rest of the guys, right? I think Ben, again, was very purposeful in his message. It's us together. And that starts mm -hmm. right now. This, uh, this offseason is going to be huge for this team. A veteran quarterback, you mentioned it, doesn't oftentimes get a fresh start with a new gro group of guys. But he has some young talent there that he can help, that can help win. I, I think this is a great opportunity for himself. But more importantly, this is a great opportunity for Mike Tomlin. This is what he needs to do to win right now. And I think Ben's certainly going to help him do because that. Because what Tomlin and Big Ben have as the most recent taste in their mouth is a collapse at the end of last season. Yeah. This is, we talk about the drama over the course of the season. Le'Veon Bell's not there. A.B. in the final week. Here's the reality. Three teams in NFL history have been at least 7-2-1 and one through 10 games and missed the playoffs. The other two lost their quarterbacks due to injury. So mm -hmm. it, it, no, any team that has seven wins through 10 weeks, they make the playoffs unless you lose your quarterback and last year's Steelers. So A.B.'s gone. Le'Veon wasn't there at all. 
Tomlin and Big Ben are the ones that have to own that. That no, yeah, okay, our consecutive seasons without a losing record streak is alive, but our playoff streak is not. Our streak is the favorites in our own division. That is not. And now, even we're even if we don't all really like each other, we're all going to have to work together because a top five running back's out the door, a top three wide receiver's out the door, and we'll see what the team looks like without those guys. I'm going to be the only Debbie Downer on this desk and say I'd like to see it. It's April. I'd like to see the same attitude, the same united front starting at the top in the locker room with Ben Roethlisberger mm -hmm. uh, come September. All right, Brian, we'll see you a little bit later on the show. Coming up, could the Warriors be in trouble after losing Boogie? We'll discuss that with Steven Jackson next on First Things First. Back here, First Things First, NBA champ, Steven Jackson. Bling, bling. You brought your ring. Bow. Playoff time. Just oh, it is playoff time. Yep. It's time, time to get it. Game OBJ, rolls OBJ around, hit me up yesterday, man, no, about you with the man. jersey. No, he didn't, man. No, OBJ, okay. What'd he say? Steven Jackson yesterday, let me tell people, got Is a that brown really your man. You know, I ain't never had nothing but love for you. Okay. There you go. You got your AFC I'm a team. I'm dog pound now. I'm, I'm dog pound. <laughs> Give me a couple barks. Let me hear. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. That's a big Show dog. Show has gone off the rails. <laughs> big dog. <laughs> Jenna, give us a couple of barks. No, thank you. Bad Damn. news for the Warriors was confirmed yesterday. DeMarcus Cousins is out indefinitely with a torn left quad. It took place in the game two loss to the Clippers. Steven, are the Warriors vulnerable now without Boogie? And if so, how much? Well, vulnerable, more vulnerable. The way they've been playing all year, they haven't looked like the championship team, so this is another knock for them. Uh, I think it's more pressure because the, as a team and as an organization inside, they know they haven't been playing well all year. Guys been up and down. They've been losing games, just lost a 31-point lead. It's not looking good for them right now. You know, a lot of people saying, like, well, they're still going to win it. Yeah, they have a chance, but to teams like Houston, to other teams in the Western Conference, they're looking more vulnerable right now. There's a lot of people saying, yes, they're vulnerable. But some of it's Boogie Cousins because we got to give Boogie credit for the type of player he is. The skill set that he has in the post, his ability to be able to bring out the five and be able to shoot the three consistently. But more of the worry comes about, and this is my question to you, Kevin Durant, bro. Mm -hmm. What kind of conversations is he having with himself right now? Because if Kevin Durant was playing Kevin Durant, because we see Steph, we know Clay, Clay going drifting out, do his thing. Right. But if KD was playing the type of basketball that we're used to, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be worried at all. Mm -hmm. Are you concerned about Kevin Durant? I'm not concerned about him, but I think in his own mind, he needs to look in the mirror and understand that Patrick Beverly's getting the best of him. And that's just what's going on. Patrick Beverly's taking him out of his game, making him do more talking, making him do worry about uh, going back and forth with Patrick Beverly than leading his team and scoring. Right now, Patrick Beverly's just getting the best of him, and that's what it's all boiled down to. And we haven't seen this with Kevin Durant before. And this is where Kevin Durant, who I believe, and I desperately believe he should be considered the best player in the world, and a lot of people do consider him the best player in the world, needs to play like that in game three. Right. Because mm -hmm. the best player in the world cannot be check all these boxes. More turnovers than field goal attempt, attempts. Gets bullied by a guy a foot shorter than him. More, more than it, a foot. Or, or, right, a full, a <laughs> literal full, sh full mm -hmm. foot shorter than him, is the key player on a team that loses a 31 point lead. The reason I say a key player is because Steph was on the bench with foul trouble mm -hmm. for the beginning of that, mm -hmm. and then blows off the post game press conference in a game where your team is dealing with the emotional devastation of watching boogies mm -hmm. quad roll up on. Him. Best player in the world can't be doing that. Right. And this is what is, though, to get back to the original question, this is what is so frustrating, I think, for a lot of just basketball fans. Forget what if you're a fan of a team or player, basketball fans, about the current iteration of the Warriors. Let's think about it. They had a bad regular season by their standards. They just lost an all-star center due to injury. Mm -hmm. They just blew the biggest lead in NBA playoff history. And their most talented player is having a bad series. And have you seen anyone with the guts to go on television or radio and be like, you know what? They're done. They're not going to win it. No, because despite all that, we're still mm -hmm. like, eh, they'll probably win the title. It'll probably be okay. Right. And that is, that's just frustrating from a, if you want intrigue or suspense in a season, everything's going wrong for them. And now they've just gone from overwhelming favorites to big favorites. That, that's the reality of the Golden State Warriors in 2019. From a strategy standpoint, 
what would you do if you're KD? Because NBA history, mm -hmm. most people haven't seen anything like this. Dirk Nowinski, they did this to Dirk a number of years ago where they tried to get up under him, but mm -hmm. Dirk ended up figuring it out right. what to do. Mm -hmm. What would you do if you were KD from a strategy standpoint? Where would you start on the court, and how would you attack Beverly? Now, you got to be KD. I, I don't want you to be Steven mm -hmm. Jackson because mm -hmm. I know how you would attack Beverly. Right. you go through his mouth right. and everything. But you know, how KD, it. based on his skill set, what do you think he should be trying to do? He got to play off the ball. He got to be more like Clay now. He got to get, get down there in the block, and he can't let Patrick Beverly push him around. I think that's what the best thing that Patrick Beverly, he's been way more physical with KD. KD's not that strong. He's just tall and long and lanky. But he has to use that to advantage. He can't block his shot. Get on that block, stop worrying about dribbling, just turn around and shoot over him. That's the best, that's the best bet. Here's the other thing, and I don't know how many people know this. The, the Warriors team, the organization, sent the NBA a bunch of clips leading up to game three, mm -hmm. of what they think is Patrick Beverly holding, clutching, grabbing, pushing. Man, I get that, but that is not – it's not a weak move, and that is what the organization's job is. Like, hey, we think we're not getting these calls – KD is not getting beat in this matchup because he's not getting the calls. He's competing. Patrick he, Beverly's competing. Patrick Beverly is doing the – and the, the Warriors feel, I've been told, like they are letting Beverly get away with things. They are. That they wouldn't let him get away with against a guy his size. That's all That's true. true. That is the reality of the NBA. That is the reality of how these games are always officiated. Welcome they're to gonna, LeBron James' world. Right. They're going to they're gonna see a guy that's a foot shorter than you and say, mm -hmm. man, the only chance he has is if he guards you with his forehead and grabs you a little mm -hmm. bit. So they're going to let him do that to a degree. You, you, the solve for the Warriors is not the referees call some fouls on Patrick Beverly. Because, by the way, he fouled out with five minutes left in that basketball right. game when the Warriors had a lead and they still lost So it. what is it? Well, I would think there's an element of why is Kevin Durant just not rising up and shooting over him? What, I, I'd like him to go more on the block. We talked about that mental. more. He, he's in his head. He's in his head. Mental. And he's trying to prove something, trying to bring the ball up. There's no way for a seven-footer to be bringing the ball up against no. one of the best 94-feet defenders in the game in Patrick Beverly. Yeah, no and way. Patrick Beverly would make it difficult if you were an undersized point guard. Exactly. He I picked Steph. I mean, he is that kind of good on the defensive end in this type of situation. I need a coach to call a play or come up with something. When I come to practice, I say, you know something? Hey, man, we got three of these sets right here, Chris. This is what we're going to do for him. That's what Steve Kerr and the coaching staff needs to do. So, Steve Kerr, mm -hmm. you need to be able to earn your money. As far as the NBA is concerned, I used to have my coaches send a set of clips and everything to the referees and everything because you want them to see them. And that's all a part of the game. You have to be able to do that. But when the whistle blow, mm -hmm. I tell the ref, I'm getting ready to take matters into my own hand. After All right? Yeah. If you're not going to call it, mm -hmm. I'm getting ready to handle it. No problem. You don't even have to worry about your stripes today. I'm getting ready to handle him. And that's the type of attitude that KD typically, he says he's tough like that. I know he's tough on Twitter, but it's time to get tough with Patrick Beverly and be able to take the game into his own hand. And it was reported yesterday, I don't know if you had insight on this or just a gut feeling being around the league as long as you have, but you were absolutely right. It was not the coach's game plan to have Beverly on KD. Beverly went to the coaches before game one and said, I want to guard him the entire time. I said time. that. Okay, it was yes. yours. My apologies. Yes, I, knew I said, said that. Here, yes. Out here yesterday. That, that wasn't the coach's idea. Mm -hmm. Beverly demanded it. Beverly said, let me get KD, see what I can do. And thus far? And the reason why I thought that, because I saw how he sized up LeBron. And he tried to do the same thing during the regular season. Now, to KD's credit. The referee during the playoffs is not consistent with the regular season. So that's one reason why Golden State sent that information in. Not only would you not let him do that against a smaller guy, but nowhere around the league are they allowing that type of physical play. We know in the playoffs it's going to be different. So with KD, he's going to have to adjust to the referee because they're not going to be calling all that stuff. From preseason to regular season to first, second, third round, the West Conference final, it's all different levels of basketball. The game has to be called different. So they need to stop whining, stop complaining, and play basketball and find a way to win. Thank you for listening to the First Things First podcast. Remember, leave us a review and tell us what you think. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts and catch us on FS1 Monday through Friday, 6.30 a.m. Eastern. For Chris Carter and Nick Wright, I'm Jenna Wolf. So long, everybody.